Thank you. Good morning. It's great to be here. Um, what a fantastic conference. Um, I'd like to congratulate the organizers. This is great. So full con confession, I am not an eDNA um, expert. I am a national manager of our biotech and, and genomics program, and I have uh, the honor of working with an incredible group of uh, eDNA scientists. Um, so some of them are my uh, are uh, co-authors on the presentation. So Shara Bailey, um, Kamia Batnager, and Sharice Dietrich are all part of my team. And then we've been working with uh, Rob Bajno from um, our Freshwater Institute, um, who's uh, done some incredible work, incredible work on eDNA. Um, uh, Genevieve Perron from, from our institute, Maurice Labontaine, who is here today. Uh, Nelly Gagne and Francis LeBlanc from our Gulf Fisheries Center. Um, and Lorraine Hamilton, who's since moved on to a, another position, but uh, Megan McBride, who is uh, taking over the, um, our aquatic biotechnology lab at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography, and um, um, also Sarah Cal, who's with our AIS National Corp program. So our story begins on March 3rd, um, 2021, when DFO was informed um, that uh, moss ball products were being imported into the, into the country and they were infested with zebra and potentially quagga mussels. Now moss balls are um, an aquarium product, they're green algae and they're both so big. Um, and they, they're imported from Eastern Europe, so that's um, one of the um, sites where um, zebra and, uh, and quagga mussels are indigenous. And both zebra and quagga mussels are um, prohibited species under the Canadian um, Aquatic Invasive Species Regulations. And it's interesting, the wording of the reg regulations prohibits importation of these species, whether they are alive or dead, which is helpful when you're looking at it, it from an eDNA context. So I'm sure everybody here knows about zebra and quagga mussels, and I don't have to go into details, um, and their devastating impacts that they've had on uh, both our ecosystems and our infrastructure. Um, I've seen one study that, that uh, estimated it costs 500 million a year to manage um, zebra and quagga mussels in the Great Lakes alone, and that was an American study. So DFO um, went into action. We um, well, once this was notified, so this was on our policy side uh, of the uh, department, and it uh, coordinated with our federal and provincial partners um, to uh, to initiate a national response to this this, uh, this incident. So they set up what's called an incident command system, and, and to uh, to horizontally manage this. Uh, this, this incident. Um, and our provinces were really concerned about this, particularly in the West. Um, we have zebra mussels um, have been slowly migrating west. Um, they are, they've been detected in Lake Winnipeg since um, 2013, and they're slowly moving um, south and west from there. But they're not yet uh, detected in um, Saskatchewan and, um, and Alberta. I think they are detected some, in some places in, in BC, though. So it was causing uh, quite a concern. So our Canadian Border Services Agency was involved and uh, they started holding um, moss balls, um, imports of moss balls at the border. And, uh, but they won't inspect them. So they were sent to our fisheries officers for inspection for, for, for moss balls. And in addition, a science advisory committee was established um, to advise the, the ICS. So our fisheries officers, um, underneath this legislation, they're allowed to give uh, what's called directions um, to importers and retailers. So they, they gave directions to dispose of infested moss balls, um, decontaminate equipment um, that was if they had already been placed in an aquarium or, or tanks, um, and to restrict the importation of moss balls into Canada and um, to stop the release, buying, selling, trading, or bartering of any fish plant or um, other organism that may have con come into contact with the, the zebra mussels. But underneath the legislation, they're limited to issue these directions for 15 days with an extension, a possible extension of 90 days. So that's only 105 days, so it was limiting. So the ICS came to us, um, uh, the Science Advisory Committee, um, and asked for some science advice. First of all, and most urgently, how to safely dispose of the moss balls as well as decontaminate the, the tanks. So our um, AIS science team was involved in this and uh, they published um, some information on, on the safe disposal of moss balls and decontamination procedures in the spring of 2021, shortly following this, this incident. 
Um, they also, the Science Advisory Committee was also asked um, to provide advice on the use of eDNA um, to help the fisheries officers with their inspections. So um, they posed four um, key questions. So first of all, can eDNA methods be applied for the detection of dracenids um, in, in moss balls? And secondly, can on-site detection methods be used to help with their screening and what are the pros and the cons? Um, thirdly, can eDNA be used for decontamination compliance testing? And if yes to any of these questions, can we provide them with a sampling protocol? So why eDNA? Um, the mussels um, were often hidden inside the, the moss balls. And for the adult stages, they, they were fairly visible. But for the um, juvenile and the villager stages, they're really hard to see, um, as anybody working with zebra mussels or quagga mussels might know. And the effort to uh, physically inspect all of the, um, the moss balls um, for the various life stages of Dracaenids would have been um, physically challenging or logistically challenging, I mean, not physically. So let's go to our first question. So um, the Science Advisory Committee issued what's called a science response, which is kind of like urgent science advice um, that, that we do instead of going through our normal national peer review process. We kind of bypass that because this was required quite urgently. So the first question, which is on the screen there, um, was can we use the eDNA methods? Um, so our Freshwater Institute, um, led by Rob Bagenau, um, started initiating testing of confiscated moss balls and developed eDNA protocols for just detecting the zebra and the quagga mussels. And he found that, um, he found that, that there is a clearer signal if he was testing the actual moss ball than the, than the water around the moss ball. So that gave him a clearer, a clearer signal and that the repeatability and reproducibility of eDNA signals um, decreased when the moss balls were improperly um, preserved. I'm sure all of you know, would know that. Um, but this was um, sort of a, a thing in progress here. And that uh, the zebra and quagga mussel DNA could be detected whether they were fresh or frozen. So the second question was on um, on-site eDNA detection methods. So we started looking at, at this as well um, and, and looked at various considerations. This work was also led by Rob Bachnow and he was finding that there was PCR inhibition because of the debris and the fine clays and the moss balls and that the in-field um, eDNA detection protocols um, for the, were not well validated. So he had concerns there. And with eDNA, we always have issues of contamination, and this was a, a regulatory issue, so we had to be very concerned about um, and cognizant of uh, false positives. So um, we needed adherence to um, sampling protocols. We needed um, positive and negative controls um, to minimize any, any false positives and, and make sure that our, our QAQC was kept high. Um, at the beginning of this incident, there were multiple service providers um, that the moss balls were being sent to. Um, the, the assays were not always known, and this was a concern, as well as the tracking of the, um, the samples. So it um, um, was key for evidence-based decisions. So um, we wanted a standardized reporting template so that there would be um, that all the data that was necessary would be provided by the, um, the fisheries officers and the labs that were testing. So the third question was, can eDNA um, be used for decontamination compliance testing? Um, so the procedures recommended for decontamination were uh, potassium chloride and freezing and heat, and as I'm sure all of you would know, that would not destroy the DNA. So um, no, we could not use the eDNA testing for um, compliance testing. We did discuss the use of eRNA, but um, it was decided by um, our scientists that the further development was needed um, of the detection methods before we could use that in this context. So the fourth question, if you'll recall, it was um, can we provide a sampling protocol? So our scientists from our, our four labs, so um, our Freshwater Institute, um, our Institute Maurice La Montagne, um, the Gulf Fishery Center is soon to be called the Atlantic Science Enterprise Center, and the Bedford Institute of Oceanography, and my team 
came together um, to develop a sampling protocol. And this is just the first um, page of the SOP that was developed. So this provides um, detailed um, guidelines on procedures for the collection, the um, preservation, the labeling, um, the packaging, and the shipping of the moss balls for our um, for our fisheries officers, and um, they were also um, provided with some training. And this step ensures that um, there is no cross-contamination and that the integrity of the sample um, samples is maintained. Uh, we also provided additional guidance to the fisheries officers not to um, um, go to multiple locations on the same site in order to minimize um, the, um, the potential for cross-contamination. Um, our scientists also developed a sample submission template, and uh, this is just a, a picture of it, um, with sample tracking on it so that we could preserve that chain of custody. So our tale continues. So in the fall of, um, we, these four labs were all involved in the testing at the time, and uh, we were triaging the samples depending upon where they were from and who, had, who was able to accept the samples. Um, and it quieted down for a little bit, um, but in the fall of 2022, um, a company imported moss balls and somehow got through our border and, and sent them to about a thousand locations across the country. So um, our Aquatic Invasive Species National Corp program renewed our discussions with the CBSA um, to, you know, somehow they had forgotten that they need to um, stop those moss balls at the border and our fisheries officers uh, renewed their um, in inspection, sending confiscated moss balls to our lab. So at that time we shifted um, all of our testing to the Atlantic Science Enterprise Center because of a small influx of resources um, at that location. So. Um, and, um, and because I was uh, an accredited lab, we're moving towards accreditation for eDNA analysis. So um, at that time, we also had discussions with our lawyers, and I mentioned some of this yesterday, is that they were very concerned about things like false positives and um, um, all sorts of questions that they had. So they asked that visual inspections be renewed, but our capacity was really limited for visual inspections. Um, so we were only triaging the visual inspections if uh, there is positive eDNA detect um, to provide a separate line of evidence um, for this investigation. So this is um, our, our simple steps, and I won't go into details because I think I'm running out of time. Um, but um, essentially we have our, our sample collection by the fisheries officers, the, the DNA is extracted, we analyze the extract using qPCR for three assays and then the interpretation and communication of the results. So the interpretation is based on your amplification curve, um, your um, controls, we use three technical replicates, and um, um, all of this information is looked at in order to provide um, a response of detected, not detected, or inconclusive. So this is just a uh, sample of some of the DNA that are some of the samples that have been processed since January. Um, so the three qPCR assays that we are using are um, uh, 16S, cytochrome B, and cytochrome oxidase. Once, and 16S is, is broader, so it um, captures both the quagga and the zebra mussels, whereas cytochrome B and cytochrome oxidase are specific to zebra mussels only. So in terms of next steps, our Atlantic Science Enterprise Center is seeking to expand their existing ISO um, 17025 uh, accreditation or certification that is specific to aquatic animal health. And they're um, adding on some modules for eDNA testing. Um, they're also working on various protocols for assay development for uh, specific to certain species, as well as um, protocols for qPCR and DNA extraction. They're also working on a decision um, framework, um, and um, we would like to develop a communications protocol. Um, we've also received rec um, recently received um, approval for funding to do an interlaboratory um, comparison amongst these four labs that have been involved, um, specific to zebra and quag quagga mussels, as well as one provincial laboratory um, in Quebec, and Guillaume is here today. So just some take home messages. There's been some questions over the last day or so about, you know, is eDNA being used in policy? And, and yes, so we're using eDNA at DFO to support management decisions for the aquatic invasive species. It's also been of great interest to a number of our other programs, such as Species at Risk, and our monitoring of marine protected areas and, and some of the um, data poor fisheries. 
Uh, we're working to increase our reproducibility of eDNA detection results so that we can support these regulatory management decisions and um, so that the results can be defensible in courts of law. And um, our, I'm pleased to say that our aquatic, um, the government or federal government through our Aquatic Invasive Species National Corps program has uh, made an investment in, um, in the establishment of an eDNA accredited lab in, in Moncton. Um, I'd like to acknowledge there have been a great number of people involved in this work, um, and I cannot possibly name them all, but um, some of the key players are, of course, our AIS National Corps program, our AIS science team, um, the conservation and protection officers, uh, the many eDNA labs at DFO, or not many, there's just really a handful of them. Um, our Dep Department of Justice legal team, who was kind of an eye-opener talking to them in terms of what questions they were asking in terms of so that they were building their case so they could, they could defend this in, in court. Um, our DFO communications team, the CBSA in our provinces. So thank you and I'd be happy to answer any questions.